Good evening. Uh, we are at the last talk of the day. Uh, this is uh, breaking ground track, and you are in Florentine A. We would like to thank our sponsors, supporters, donors, who have made this uh, B-Sides possible. Uh, do go to your booth, say them hello and thanks for making this wonderful uh, convention possible. Uh, next, we have <coughs> Andrew Brand. Uh, Andrew Brand is director at Threat Research uh, at Blue Code Systems. Uh, and the topic which we are having is uh, ingress, egress, the emerging threats posed by the augmented reality gaming. For all the Pokemon Go lovers, uh, this could be an interesting talk. Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Great. All right, give me one second because this thing crashed my uh, graphics driver. on PowerPoint. All right. All right, great. So um, thanks very much for coming. Um, I'm Andrew Brand. I'm the director of threat research at Blue Coat. Um, my normal day job involves me running a lot of malware in a lab in which I uh, not only record the behavior of the malware, but I'm also recording the, um, the network traffic of the malware communicating with its command and control servers, downloading payloads. And to do that, we have a bunch of appliances that the company makes, and I just use those products in my research. Um, but I'm also a gamer, and I, I found, uh, as I got a little older, that playing uh, Twitch games on a, on a screen uh, actually started to give me migraines and make me feel sick and, I, and it was a really depressing experience until I discovered augmented reality gaming and so I, I got into this game called Ingress um, in, in, a, in a pretty big way. Is this going to work? Right. So in this talk I'm going to talk a little bit about the fundamentals of the game itself but I'm also going to talk about how I use some of the tools in my lab to de uh, decrypt and um, decode some of the communications in the game just to learn a little bit more about how that game worked. Um, now, a lot of you know that uh, Niantic, the company that makes Pokemon Go, is the same company that makes uh, Ingress. And Ingress, in a lot of ways, uh, is both a precursor of and a supporter of the Pokemon universe. So there's a lot of cross-pollination involved in both games. And it, what I see here as being a number of different problems, some of them have been addressed by Niantic in Pokemon Go, but a lot of them persist, uh, especially those uh, involving personal safety, privacy, and we're going to talk about all of those things. Uh, but we're also going to talk about what Niantic has done. And, and what I'd like to do, because this is the breaking ground track, and they're asking that this be a very uh, interactive uh, back and forth, is I'm hoping that the audience will come forth with suggestions. I know there's a number of Ingress players who are here in the room, um, as, as well as just people who are interested in privacy and security. So uh, I'm hoping that you'll have good suggestions at the end. I have a lot of slides to get through, so I'm just going to whip through it as quickly as possible. All right, so, so what is Ingress? So Ingress is this very interesting science fiction themed game with a very paranoid uh, backstory involving uh, aliens making a kind of covert uh, intrusion into this world from another dimension. And as they're doing that, um, the, some of their technology is leaking into this dimension and only people with special things called scanners, i.e. the Ingress app, are able to see this technology uh, for what it is. Think of it as, um, as they live for like the year 2016. You've got these goggles where you can see all kinds of stuff that isn't there that normal people can't see. You can interact with these things and you use that to advance within the game, attack other teams, uh, and just uh, have a lot of fun out in the real world. Um, everything that happens in the game takes place uh, in or around these things called portals. Portals are basically user submitted physical locations in the real world. They have to be human created things with some kind of artistic or creative or cultural social value that users have submitted to Niantic and Niantic has had a human uh, basically approve these as being locations that can be portals and everything happens with these portals. Um, the only way that you can interact with portals is to be standing 40 meters or less from the portal itself. So a lot of the interaction within the game, at least 
the legitimate interaction that's done by players who aren't cheating and doing other kinds of goofy stuff is to be walking around in the world, going to these portals and interacting with them. But that's not always the case. So the correlation between Pokemon Go and Ingress is really, really obvious to people who've been playing Ingress even for a little while. Um, th these are just two screenshots of um, on the left side are the, uh, the screen for a portal, and on the right side are the screen for a Pokestop or a gym. And basically, in smaller towns where there aren't a lot of places to play these things, it is a pretty much a one-to-one -one correlation. But in places like Las Vegas, where there are absolutely tons of portals crowding the entire city, what you see is that there's sort of a, a one out of every three or one out of every four portals has been removed from Pokemon Go and is not a Pokestop or a gym, uh, just because the density is too high. Um, so the other thing that uh, is kind of key to understand in the, in the background is just sort of how, the, how you play the game a little bit. Um, everything that you do in the game in, involves you using this stuff called exotic matter. This is the stuff from the science fiction universe that is leaking into our universe. It, essentially, it's uh, energy that you get by walking around in the world. And it's, in the game, it's represented as these little like floating blobs that as you walk along, they, they kind of get sucked into your player's uh, avatar in the game. And when you have enough of this energy, you can do things in the game. Um, the other thing about it that's kind of cool and, and appeals to me as a security guy is that your primary way of interacting with these portals is to hack them. It is actually, there is a button that says hack in the game and that, that hacking the portals is the primary way in which you gather gear and collect keys and do other things that, that involve uh, gathering resources to do stuff within the game. Um, now there's two scoring methods. There's a personal scoring method for each individual player where they get points based on how far they walk, how many portals they hack, how many unique portals they hack or capture, the length of links between them, the fields, the size of fields that they make out of linking triangles of these uh, portals together, are, uh, all contribute to an individual score. Um, but then there is a separate scoring mechanism to factions or teams within the game that is purely based on the, um, the, the area that is captured on the planet Earth uh, by your team. So in the game, uh, for people who play the game, uh, there is this other sort of web resource that you can use on a laptop that's called the Ingress Intel map. And essentially, it is Google Earth with a view into the Ingress world. And, and what this is showing is kind of a, a really widely zoomed out world view of the, the biggest uh, links and the biggest areas in which uh, different teams have captured these uh, colored areas are called fields. And, um, but if you zoom in, the closer you get to any physical location, you actually s discover that, you know, such as like right here at the, at the Tuscany, there are six portals within reach. And I took this screenshot uh, about an hour ago, but I just killed this green portal that's here in the middle and turned, turned it gray. So, uh, so if you're playing in here and you, you want to capture a free portal, like just, you know, drop a couple resonators on it right now. Resistance. What's that? Exactly. So uh, if you didn't notice, I'm actually wearing uh, the key of the resistance faction. Uh, that's the faction that I play for. So uh, just other uh, elements that I wanted to just sort of mention in, in passing, just because it's such a rich game and there's so many ways that you can play it, um, there's a, a puzzle game within the game that uh, called Glyphing, where you, instead of hacking, you hold down the hack button for a long time and you kind of draw little patterns on the screen. It's, it's a little bit of like a memorization game because it does these little uh, symbols called glyphs and you have to repeat them. And you get more gear if you do them accurately and fast. Um, again, there's these badges that you can get for different accomplishments within the game that's uh, kind of among players. Um, and then every once in a while, um, players will get together in cities in events organized by Niantic called an anomaly. Uh, for example, the n nearest next one is going to be in two weeks in Denver. And what happens in those places is the, the company sets out certain portals as being uh, critical uh, capture points for one faction or the other to either hold or to take away from the other faction. And the, dis the winners of these anomalies actually decide key decision points within the, the uh, fictional storyline of the game and, and help drive the story in one way or another. So the anomalies are actually pretty key to the, uh, to the sort of ongoing uh, backstory that happens within the game. Um, and, and also just uh, 
as, as another thing, the people who are uh, at this event especially will really appreciate the fact that there are these things called passcodes, which are 10 character codes that when you enter them into your scanner app on your phone, uh, will give you extra gear. And one of the ways that people discover these passcodes, well, some of them are leaked by Niantic, and some of them are handed around by teams to their friends. But what is actually very interesting is that um, the, the company puts out these videos and screenshots and other interesting art uh, on their website and on their Google Plus page. And if you search through these images, often in the metadata or sometimes just buried in the image, uh, almost as a steganographic exercise, they will put these passcodes in there. And there are teams of people who just do steganography and image analysis to find these things. Um, it is just kind of a cool side game. And there's just some screens from the game showing, uh, for instance, the, the Guardian badge, which is one of the, the rarest and most difficult badges to obtain because it involves maintaining control of a portal that you captured for a certain number of days, and the highest level badge is 150. It's, it is by far the hardest badge in the game to get and keep uh, just because of the nature of the game. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the communications within Ingress. So there are basically, there is this mechanism in Ingress to send messages back and forth between players, uh, as well as the game itself will send game messages involving, uh, say, like when some one person attacks an, a portal that's controlled by another person or the other faction, uh, that person will receive a little alert message in their scanner app that says, so-and-so is attacking this portal at this location. Um, and all of this stuff is basically broadcast to everybody who's within a certain geographic radius of uh, a, a, the location where the event is happening uh, and is, has the game on or is looking at the uh, Intel map. So um, this chat window, uh, the one on the left is the one from the game and the one on the right is the one from uh, Intel, but essentially they are showing you the same thing, which is little text messages that people are sending back and forth to each other or mostly actions that happen within the game that involve the changeover between one uh, faction or attacks that are happening in real time or captures. Um, and actually it's worth pointing out, um, just to go back here, this one on the left, and I know it's hard to see in this light room, but the, the text that's in white is a broadcast message that was sent out by a player who is advertising a, uh, a black market gear store. So there are people who are playing this game, gathering gear specifically so they can sell it for real money outside of Niantic purview to other players. And we'll talk about that in a minute. So to do the capturing that I did is really fairly rudimentary and it doesn't require all the gear that I have in my, in my lab. It, was, it just makes it easier. Um, I have a wireless access point that I use to connect the phones that I'm using and the other mobile devices I'm using. And I use them all the time to uh, capture uh, malicious traffic on infected Android devices. But I'm, in this case, I was using it to capture the traffic from my phone and other phones that I was using to play the game. Um, I'm using something that sniffs that traffic and, and, and allows me to save it and uh, manipulate it in a lot of ways. It's called Security Analytics. And uh, the box that's pictured here is called the SSL Visibility Appliance. And it is essentially a standalone man in the middle SSL decryptor box that is sold to corporations who want to use it for data loss prevention or policy enforcement on their internal networks. And I'm giving a talk about the SSL Visibility Appliance at DEF CON at the Crypto and Privacy Village on Saturday morning if you want to hear more about that. And that's all I'm going to say about it is that this is what I was using. So, and when you're, when you're uh, running SSL decryption uh, in an Android device and you have to add the certificates, the re-signing certs into the device, uh, there are some persistent warnings that appear in the device. And I just thought I'd show these because it's worth noting that you can't just do this SSL decryption without the person who's being monitored knowing about it. First of all, you have to manually install these certs, which is an, a non-trivial exercise to get them on the phone and install them. And it, secondly, you, it then pops up these warning messages pretty persistently um, almost all the time in the no notification bar. And then when you hit the notification, it pops up this bigger window that says, you really could be being monitored right now by someone you don't know, um, except you probably do know who it is. All right, so um, this is the UI from the SSL Visibility Appliance, and it's just showing a log of the sessions that were decrypted during, during a, um, a, a bunch of uh, communications. Uh, you, this one in particular of the startup of Ingress. And what it's showing you here is on the left is a column of the uh, IP addresses and the ports. 
the, then the names of the domain, the domain names that we were doing the communication, the cipher suite that was being used, and then it says it was using the re-signed certificate decryption, and most of them it says success, but on the, the second to last one it says alert bad record MAC, and that just means that there was a uh, mismatch in the MAC address on that particular, um, that particular session. So when the, when the app starts up, the first thing it does, because and, and, and again, I don't know if you're aware of this, but Niantic is actually a spin-off of Google. At the time when Ingress was launched, it was a part of Google. It was one of their divisions. And now it is a separate company. But they still ha share a lot of the same ecosystem. And the first and most important is that they are using Google OAuth. You are taught your game account is tied to your Google address and your other Google information that's in uh, that's on your phone. And uh, th this became you know, pretty well known in the first week of Pokemon Go's release because there was a big hoo-ha about the fact that Pokemon was basically getting all permissions to everything tied to your uh, Google account. That has now been fixed, but this is basically what is happening is that they are just validating that your account is properly owned by you. It's on a phone that you have used before for this account, and they're just doing this check. And you can actually see um, in the circled in red, it says com.niantic.project.ingress. That's the name of the app, the internal name uh, uh, of the APK in, in Android. Um, so the next thing it does, and, and this is kind of interesting, is it connects to, it gets a positive uh, connection from uh, something called Google Cloud to Device uh, messaging. Now this is, it, it's interesting because cloud to device messaging was actually discontinued last October by Google. They actually put out a big notification that says, we're stopping using this, don't incorporate this into any of your apps anymore, we're going to shut the service down. And yet, C2DM is actually working and every time you start up Ingress, there's a little C2DM uh, session that goes back and forth. And we know for sure because Security Analytics was able to show us, that once again, com.nianticproject.ingress was the source of that communication and that was what was being sent as an HTTP post uh, up to Niantic, or I should say up to Google. So then once you've gone through the authentication process, there's, these, um, uh, there's an initial setup that happens in which the game uh, receives uh, a bunch of initial data just so that when the UI pops up, it's populated with information. Um, it, uh, it is, first you send it up your uh, latitude and longitude using the location services on the phone. It queries the phone, it says, where are you? It sends that back to Niantic, and Niantic does some stuff on their end where they figure out within a certain radius, five kilometers, 10 kilometers, however you've got it configured in the phone itself, um, it will then send back chat messages that have been sent within that radius as well as the event messages. And that's what's sent, that's what's sent in this very first packet, the back and forth, is the geotagging information about where you are and then all of the messaging stuff and stuff that would happen in the comms window uh, that you would see as soon as you started the app up. Um, the next thing that happens is that it, is, it then transmits to you um, a lot more of that chat messaging going back uh, uh, quite a ways for like the last two or three hours previously, uh, as well as pretty much all of the configuration information that is used to define, for instance, uh, what are the various values that are used by the game to determine whether you're within a certain range or have a certain level of weapon to defeat a thing that is of this other level within the game. All of that configuration data is sent every single time you start the game. So there is this, this back and forth and handoff of the, um, the rules of the game that, that are sent to the phone. Now, it's an academic exercise to understand that if you are receiving all of this configuration information that decides how the game is going to work, that why would someone not just inter inter interface with the network card between the game and Niantic and just tweak those values a little bit for their own benefit? Oh, and by the way, it is worth mentioning that uh, the two factions in the game, one is called the Resistance, one is called the Enlightened. The Resistance are the humans who believe that this alien technology, thank you very much, uh, that this alien technology is something that is, we should be a little wary of. We don't understand the motives of these aliens. Maybe we should take a step back and not quite accept it so rapidly. The enlightened are the team whose philosophy is, we should embrace this. They are just nothing but beneficial. Everything is good. The, 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 all this, the, the, the benefits of this technology are good for everyone. Why not just embrace it, right? It is worth noting that in the internal messaging of the system, 
the enlightened team is referred to as aliens. So be warned, you are working for the aliens. So, um, so the next thing that happens is that uh, the uh, Niantic app sends a little handshake that's called SUP. And when that comes back, here, here is all of our configuration data that comes back to the device, right? So as I mentioned, you've got, you've got all the rules for uh, what are the glyphs that can do things when you are trying to do glyphing uh, to make the glyphs happen faster, give you more keys. Um, the action cost for different actions within the game, the weapons radius for different weapons within the games, the badge tiers, all of this stuff is transmitted every single time in the handshake. It's not really clear to me why this isn't just hard coded into the app, but I guess if they wanted to change the game uh, on the fly, they could literally just change some settings on the server and then everyone's game would work in the different way, but it just seems to me like it's just opportunity for, uh, for a lot of messing around. So in addition to the app itself, um, the app has several analytics tools that are built into it. One of them is the Upsite API. And Upsite API is a very common, widely used, le completely legitimate um, uh, Android app analytics company. And Niantic is using it for doing in-app purchases. There are some things that you can buy for real money using your Google account um, in the game that will help you, um, you know, accumulate more gear or do other things within the game that are fun. Nothing that gives you a huge advantage, but some stuff that gives you a little advantage. Um, and so they're using Upside API to do all this payment uh, management and, and to control uh, how that happens within the game. Um, when you first log in, though, Upside sends a huge amount of data about your device itself, the make, model number, the geolocation of it, what mobile network it's on, what version of Android it's running, whether or not it's rooted, what's the localization, what language is it using, um, how many days have you been active in the game? Have you, has, has there been a, a gap of several days since you played it, or, or have you played it in the last 24 hours? And all of this stuff is sent to Upsite at the same time as you're logging into the game. And then there is a third, or second analytics, or a third set of information that's sent to a different company called Criticism, and that is also sending information about the version of the app, the version of uh, Android that you're running, the name and the make and model of the phone that you're using, the country code of the country to which your SIM card is tied, and a bunch of other information, including like the, the build date of the app um, and its version and, and localization. So, so already you've got um, you know, two third-party companies that are receiving an enormous amount of device data about the device that you're running the game on. Then what happens is, as you play the game, there are all these API calls that happen. And they, they again, uh, like most of the other ones that are happening throughout the game, it's an HTTP post up to uh, Niantic with some data and then a response back. And they have names like this. And they're involved in doing things like updating the inventory of your gear that you have, updating the map that's shown on the screen, updating the chat messages that are shown in comms. And they're basically happening constantly. And it's one of the reasons why when you run uh, Ingress for an extended period of time, and if you know people who play Ingress, you always see them carrying these giant ass external battery packs and giant like plugs and wires and things like this. Thank you very much. Um, we are all carrying these battery packs because all of this data and all of this using of the GPS constantly is just chewing through the power in our phones. But we are pushing the envelope on what you can do with these things. So it's kind of interesting to see it all happening. The most interesting uh, API call that I see is this one that's called Get Paginated Plex. And the Get Paginated Plex is interesting because it contains all of the rich, juicy detail about everything that's happening by other people as well as yourself within the game. It's all those text messages that I mentioned earlier, plus all the action messages. But in addition to the texts and the actions, and which is not displayed by the client itself in the UI, but it's shown, it's shown to the uh, API but not displayed in the UI, is things like uh, unique user IDs for all the players, unique IDs for all of the portals and locations in which you're playing, as well as all of the geolocation data for all of these events that are happening, whether they're done by you or by someone else. So all of this information is constantly being fed to your phone, and because you can receive it all and can man in the middle it, you then have access to a lot of shenanigans that you can do if you, say, collect it all. We'll talk about that in a minute. What else is interesting? So there was this one session that we decrypted 
at the, at the end, the one that had the weird MAC address problem, and it was on this strange port, 7275, and I had to do a little research on this, and I discovered that there is this tool called ULP, User Plane Location Protocol. It's a protocol that is basically used by apps that use GPS. They go out and they receive telemetry about where in the sky are the satellites that are above you right now, and it's a way to more quickly get your GPS to sync and get the location faster. And it was just interesting to see. It's TLS over this weird port, and if you, if you look at the packet itself, because it's not an HTTP packet, um, and it's really hard to see because it's so tiny, but like right up here it says degrees of latitude, degrees of longitude. It's very, very precise. Uh, satellite data with uh, uh, nine or ten uh, degrees of uh, accuracy. So it's very, very precise geolocation data, plus all the error code values so that you can uh, do the calculation and get your, your location down as, as precisely as possible. Um, it's also worth noting uh, at this point that the OAuth stuff that Pokemon Go is doing is very similar to what we see, um, but we're also seeing, um, we also see that they have made some improvements. Now one of the, as I mentioned earlier, one of the improvements that they've made uh, is that they're, they're doing a little bit less of the, um, it, it's a little less obvious. Uh, they're not using a user agent string that is uh, directly connectable to Pokemon Go. Uh, the user agent in, in Ingress, as I mentioned, is Nemesis, and they're using the, the sort of d standard Dalvik uh, user agent string that's used by apps that, that hook the network device. Um, you, you'll also see that there's no chat messaging uh, but there's a lot of binary data that's being passed back and forth. However, the few things that they are doing that are similar is because they're using the same location database, and they've already built an infrastructure involving UUIDs for the locations, the, um, those hash values and the names of the locations, as well as their pictures, are, are being transmitted in the clear in this, uh, in this stuff. But it is essentially doing the same thing, where it's doing this API HTTP post stuff back to the server, getting a response back. It just doesn't have nearly as much data in it. Right. Oh, and this is just the this is the uh, Pokemon Go OAuth. So, so if you if you didn't know this, for people who are under 16, I think, if your kid playing Pokemon Go, you have to sign instead of having a Google, a Google account, you have to sign up through um, uh, Nintendo has this thing called the Pokemon Trainers Club, and so you have to create an account on Pokemon Trainers Club, and then when you log in, instead of going through Google OAuth, it goes through Nintendo's uh, separate OAuth, and then this is just the header stuff. Um, boy, it's a really fuzzy picture. I'm sorry. Is there any way you could focus the projector a little bit? Um, it's just really blurry, but like, yeah, this is all the header data that shows um, they're sending things, um, including, uh, it's really hard to see, but birth date of the player um, in that OAuth uh, session data. So um, as well as, um, there's actually parents' email in there because you have to tie a Pokemon uh, Go a kids account to a parents account. Um, so it has UUID stuff, and then there's uh, something called date of consent. And I, and I didn't really understand what that was, but in the, in the kids account that I created, I noticed that uh, age or the date of consent is exactly 13 after birth date. So apparently 13 is the age of consent as far as Pokemon Go is concerned. That's okay. <laughs> All right, so let's talk a little bit about what, what you can do when you can scrape this data and you can suck it all down. So there are some very clever people who have figured out all of this stuff that I've shown you so far, and they have built data collection systems that are using, the, they're using um, uh, bogus accounts that are fake geolocated all over the world to collect all of these player action things from everywhere in the world simultaneously. And they're databasing this stuff, and they've been databasing it for years. Um, they're capturing, decrypting, and, and parsing all of this stuff and making it searchable with really nice UI. Um, there are at least three of these for each faction. And it's been a kind of an open secret among the Ingress community that this exists for some time because um, it does violate the, uh, the uh, Niantic terms of service to be doing this. Um, but more importantly, and the reason that I'm talking about it, is that it opens up a lot of opportunity for people to do some really bad things. So, um, so I just got back from the UK, and one of the things I did, and of course I was playing Ingress when I was there because it was exciting, and one of the badges you can get is for capturing the, uh, a, new, a portal that you've never captured before for the first time. So I was trying to get all these uniques, and uh, I was very proud of the fact that when I went to North Wales, I captured 
every World Heritage Site castle in North Wales. That was, that was my big victory, and I, was, and I was so proud I took screenshots of it. Um, so it was, it was uh, Conway, Carnarvon, and, and Beaumaris are the three World Heritage Sites. And the coolest thing about Gwydir Castle is it's known as the most haunted castle in England, or in, in uh, the UK. So, uh, so I got the most haunted castle and the three World Heritage Sites. But little did I know that while I was doing this, one of these player trackers was monitoring mine and every other player in the world's use of the game and created this heat map that shows exactly where I was and how long I spent in using the game at these different locations in North Wales. And when I saw this, it scared the crap out of me because Again, it's only an academic exercise to understand that what these player trackers are able to do is keep track of an enormous amount of location data, let you view by time slice where that location data is, and then even further, you can slice it down to morning, afternoon, evening, like what is the propensity of a certain player to be in a certain place at between 8 o'clock and 10 o'clock in the morning. Well, you might find the neighborhood where the person lives. You might find where their office is, where they frequent, where they go shopping, where they drop their kids off from school and then hack the portal at the church down the street. There's a lot of ways that this can be abused. So um, here's another view of a different player tracker. This, this one shows um, some of the players that are, that are located in, in northern Colorado where I live. And it was used by the players in, on my faction to monitor players on, on, on our faction who we knew were doing bad stuff. And so there, the ones that are in, in gray are real players, and the ones, they're, they're, sorry, the ones that are light colored are real players, and the ones that are highlighted in kind of this green gray uh, shading are the players who are using what we think are spoof accounts or bot accounts to uh, conduct themselves in ways that un they're not befitting a uh, player who is responsible and respectable. Um, Here's a different view of a different player tracker showing the details of a particular spoofer who we know was doing some really bad stuff. And um, again, it's really hard to see, but I'll just show you that it's, it's got the, the names, the days owned, and the date of uh, each captured portal that this guy had under his control. And there's a, there's a little button here that says add to threat watch. So that if there are players who are on this green faction um, who were causing problems for other people, uh, the members of the blue faction who run this particular tracker were able to put this person on a watch list so they could keep a closer eye on them and collect more data about them and get alerts on when they were doing certain things. And, you know, th again, it, was, it le could lead to shenanigans. Um, so this is, this is a, a yet a different player uh, indexing service, and this is data about my account. Um, it shows that uh, my region is Utah. For some reason, it shows the region that I'm in as being the place where I hacked my very first portal, which happens to be near uh, Blue Coat's offices in Draper, Utah. But that is not my, my physical location. It's just where, where I started the game. Um, it also shows that I started the game on uh, July 1st, 2015 at uh, 9.34 or 9.24 in the evening while I was out for dinner with some of my coworkers. Um, and it has all of my badges and how long I've been playing and what is the longest uh, con continuous number of days I've been playing, how long is the, the um, number of days that I've had my guardian for, et cetera. Um, here's more details about my account, and it actually shows, so these are some of the portals in the UK that I visited while I was on my trip, but then there's some of these ones that are from uh, Colorado, and then the one that is grayed out with the name buzzed is my Guardian portal, and it's hard to see, but it says it's 262 days. Um, it turns out that while I was in the UK, um, I, made the, uh, I made a grave error. I, I had met with a couple of people who were on my faction who I thought were friendly players, and we had hung out and had a few beers and played a little bit and, and gotten together a few times. And, I told, and they, the guy said, like, hey, you know, do you have any, you have good, you have any good uh, guardians? You know, there's a couple portals around here that have some good guardians. And I sent the guy a screenshot that showed that my guardian list was up to over 250 days. And um, within 48 hours of having that conversation, my guardian got taken down. My guardian, by the way, is somewhere in Texas. So whoever it was that that information got to used a system that was just like this, used a bot to go to Texas and killed my guardian with a bot. Not cool. Of course, I'd already gotten the badge, so I didn't really care. At that point, it was just you know, gravy. It's not, it's not guardian, it's a pet. Exactly, it was a pet. So, uh, so these are the issues, right? So it allows people to, um, to find, track, 
and observe the behavior of other people very, very easily. This is a tracking service that you are willingly carrying around with you in your pocket and feeding with data about where you like to go. Um, and it has been implicated in a number of um, real player-to-player -player negative interactions involving stalking and harassment in the real world. Um, so in the course of doing the research for this talk, um, I put out a, a question and answer uh, thing on uh, Reddit, as well as I kind of interviewed a bunch of players that I know, and there have been experiences that I've had with other players in my community and other communities in which we know for a fact that there are players out there who are hostile, aggressive, and have followed people around, found their houses, and then deliberately done things to harass them as a way to um, make, it, make it harder for them to play the game or to drive them out of the game. And this is a problem that is not going to go away unless we solve the problem of this scraping. All right, let's talk a little bit about what these bots can do. So GPS spoofing and bots has been a problem within the game pretty much since it started. As you can imagine, we're in a game in which hacking is part of the sort of thematic storyline of the game. It attracts a certain audience of people who are interested in exploration of the digital universe, uh, myself included, but, but not limited to me. And people discovered fairly early on that there are these JPS spoofing apps that you can use for development purposes, of course, just to uh, force your phone to say that it is in a different location. And then every, everything that kind of pulls that location data um, uh, from the phone thinks it's in a different place. And then it, it, can, you know, it will let you do things like Google Maps of a different town uh, without having to zoom in there. Um, what the guys who are doing this are doing it for is sort of two purposes. Um, but we'll get into those in a minute. Uh, for definition of purposes, spoofers are just people who using uh, these tools to forge their GPS and make themselves appear to be in a different location. Bots are automated systems that are using spoofing to do actions automatically without human interaction in those spoof locations. So one of the things that is really important to note is that spoofing is something that uh, Niantic is trying very, very hard to thwart. And all of the common Things. If you just go and you look for GPS spoofing on Google Play Market, uh, there are a bunch of apps in there. None of them will work on uh, Ingress without getting you banned pretty quickly. Um, the, the purpose of having all of these analytics communicating with the, with the device is because they're looking specifically for these apps running in the background. And um, the way that you hide these inf the information about these apps from Niantic itself, one way to do it is to run this thing called the Exposed Framework. So it's, it's on this website, repo.exposed.info. And it, is, um, it comes as both an APK and a zip. And it, it does have a kind of a high barrier to entry because you have to sideload it using uh, Android uh, desktop bus. Um, you have to ADB flash it onto the device. And so it is probably beyond the ken of most mortal people who have Android phones. However, I believe everyone in the room here is probably capable of doing it themselves. Um, and it is a very effective method of doing GPS spoofing so that you avoid getting banned and kicked out of the game and losing all the gear that you illicitly got. Um, so some of the things that the bots can do um, are basically everything that you can do within the game. So they can hack or glyph the portals. They can retrieve keys and get gear. They follow certain tracks. You can record a GPS track and then have your bot follow that track, um, almost like, a, like a, you're playing back a video. Um, they can attack enemy portals as they walk past them. Uh, they can also just uh, teleport, jump from place to place in a ridiculously short amount of time, an amount of time that a human would notice very quickly is far too rapidly. So for instance, I flew between uh, Denver and Las Vegas. It's about a 90 minute flight. And yet, you know, I could, if I wanted to, um, be in Boulder where I live, teleport back to Vegas, do some stuff, teleport off to some other place. And for the most part, that kind of stuff doesn't get noticed. Um, when, you, when this exposed framework is kind of tied in, um, these bots can do basically everything. And what they are being used for is they are using them for harvesting huge amounts of the highest level gear, which is a um, mentally and physically taxing effort. As you can imagine, you don't just go to these portals 
um, and hack them one time. If you want to farm gear, say for an anomaly that's coming up, you will often find that one faction or the other will get together. They'll find a park that has five or six or ten portals that are really close to each other. They will then level those portals up so that they give the highest level of gear. And then people will walk around and glyph them for hours. And this, is, this takes a lot of work and takes a lot of effort. And you have to be good at the glyphing puzzle game, which is not, I, I can tell you from my own experience, is not a trivial exercise. It is something that takes a lot of work. And yet these bots can basically glyph everything as fast as possible. And the only way that you can, uh, the, the, the only consideration that you need to have when you're running one of these bots is that you got to dial it back a little bit because the bot is so good, it's going to attract notice. And so a lot of these sliders that are in these bots are to control just how accurate, like how often will it fail? And how often will it, will it meander off this GPS track and look like you're just kind of walking across the street instead of following a straight line and then taking a left turn and making a 45 degree turn and going across a field that normally is blocked off with a chain link fence. All of this stuff is basically just to make the bot work faster. Right? And we have these uh, infographics, and again, it's really hard to read, but this is an infographic about how a bot works and what these farm bots can do. This was one uh, that was produced by the people who I, work, who I play with specifically to, um, to teach people about how these bots are doing farming and how you identify the farming bots as opposed to the bots that are being used to spoof and, and attack people. So the, the most popular one, the one that everybody knows about, uh, again, it's an open secret within the Ingress community, is this bot called Ganesh. It's $12 to use it for three months. And it is shamelessly advertising itself as being the bot to do everything bad within the game. Now, um, it's, it's a very... Uh, uh, it's a very paranoid guy who's in Eastern Europe who makes the bot. When you buy it, it they, make, they make a build that is just for you, and the bot itself does some command and control back to the guy's web server so that he knows that your license key is only being used for your account. And if he sees you using it for any other account, or if he sees you using it in a way that he doesn't like, he will just ban you forever for, for life from ever being able to get his bot again. And it calls itself internally bad logic. Now, um, and this is just some internals of Ganesh and showing you the UI. Um, and, and then, the, for example, this is the, the walk mode where you can, you can either have it walk in a straight line or walk and then loop back. Um, and this is the, uh, I, I've done a little bit of uh, reversing of the app and uh, sh showing some of the source code. And this is just the drop down of the code. And it, all of the code is pretty heavily obfuscated with all this. Um, there's a lot of this sort of junk text that's all through all the variables and stuff. It just makes it a little harder to read. But for somebody who's an experienced reverser, it's just sort of rudimentary. But you don't have to do Ganesh. You can actually, there are some commercial emulators out there that you can use to, uh, to get into these things. Uh, one of them is this one that's called the Knox App Player. And it's worth noting in the text at the bottom here, it says, location required by app, the virtual location feature will pin you to wherever you want. Now this one I showed because they're actually advertising a particular build that you can get of this app that's called Pokemon Go Desktop. And the idea was, of it was you could play Pokemon on your desktop without ever having to walk out into the real world. Well, guess what? It still works. It was advertised as something that you could use during the beta. And now it still works with the real Pokemon now. And as far as I can tell, I've been using it for weeks, and it hasn't gotten me banned. So. So it is still functional. Now, um, there's another company that does a similar app called Jenny Motion. Um, but you do need to use the exposed framework on these software Android devices, or else eventually you will get caught, banned, and you'll lose all your lovely Pokemon and balls and everything else. So this is just a screenshot showing a, a famous location in Boulder, the uh, Dushanbe Tea House. And uh, you just use this little uh, map window within the app to pin wherever you want the game to say that you are. And then all of a sudden within the game, I'm standing at the Dushanbe Tea House, and I'm glyphing it, and I'm doing all the bad stuff that I want to do. And it, and it also has these like helpful features for people who want to do this kind of hacking, fake IMEIs. You can create your own phone number and phone network that you're on. All of it is basically uh, just forgery that allows these apps to work, uh, again, for development purposes. Ha ha, not really. Um, but um, everything about this just really sucks. And what this does is it feeds this market for black market gear. Um, both factions are responsible for running these Gannett spots. They give out the gear 
in huge amounts to their buddies because it really is trivial for them to be able to collect massive amounts of gear. But then they turn around and sell it for dollars on the web. And these guys are advertising this stuff on the chat window to all the players. The one I like the most is this one here. It says, for 10 bucks, we'll give you four keys to any one portal that you want anywhere in the world. And to me, that's amazing because you know, if I wanted to, I could pay this guy 10 bucks. He sends his bot down to McMurdo Station in Antarctica, where the two portals that are the rarest portals in the world are, because only the 50 scientists that go to the South Pole and are there can hack those portals. And this guy will give me four of those keys for 10 bucks. Woohoo! What an achievement! I haven't actually been to McMurdo. That sucks. That ruins the game for everyone. And, and honestly, that is, that is exactly the problem with all of this stuff. It violates the spirit and the letter of the rules, and it just makes everyone in the game pissed off at each other. Both factions accuse the other side of cheating. It's true. Both sides are cheating. It's become an arms race. And the problem is that it's not going to go away as long as the game allows it to happen. So let's talk about how we address these problems. Because the real problem is that Niantic is a company with great intentions and who has two hit games on their hands, but does not have more than 50 employees and is basically lost at trying to solve these problems. They're overwhelmed by the amount of people who are playing Pokemon Go. The, the, it, you know, when I pitched this talk to the conference, it was all just um, a lot of these discussions about the problems that were going to happen with the augmented reality games were hypothetical. Or there had been you know, a couple of instances here and there of people you know, falling off their bikes or getting into car crashes. But it wasn't on the scale of today where the police departments in New York, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and Boston are sending out Pokemon Go player tips. Like, don't walk into really bad neighborhoods late at night all by yourself with your really expensive phone and big battery out, hanging out. You know, you're going to get mugged. You know, and stuff like this was all hypothetical two months ago. Now it's happening every day. So we've got to solve this. So one of the biggest problems is this data scraping issue where the, basically you're walking around with a GPS tracker in your pocket that shows everyone where you are all the time. These are my suggestions. We've got to stop broadcasting the player data with the actions in the game. So when it says Andy Brandt hacked Portal X, or Andy Brandt attacked this portal and captured it from player Y. You should never have names associated with that. It should just be portal X is under attack. Portal X has been captured by the other side. That would eliminate all of this player tracking stuff in which this data is being sent out and people are scraping it and showing the heat map thing that shows where you are would be gone. Everything has to be encrypted, right? We, it is a watchword of, of all of what we do in InfoSec. You encrypt everything that you possibly can. Now, it's inside TLS, and that's great because the transport layer is an important thing to encrypt. But why is the data in plain text? Why is this all JSON in plain text inside of the TLS? They learned this lesson with Pokemon Go. That's a good thing. They need to then revert and put that stuff into ingress. It needs to be encrypting that data so that all that we're seeing across the wire is a big binary data blob that we cannot read. And of course, ingress and uh, Niantic needs to be monitoring the players and their activity a little more closely. Location service stuff is another issue, right? So when in, in all my malware research stuff, I'm always looking for metadata attribute combinations that will lead me to find interesting traffic. Well, here's a metadata attribute that I love. Check the geo IP of the IP address you're using, and does that correlate to anywhere near or even in the same country as the, G the IP address, the geolocation data that's coming from the GPS? If you're, if you're in the UK and your phone says you're in Texas, but you're on a UK network connection, something is wrong. And the fact that Niantic isn't seeing this is also wrong. It has to be pointed out to them by the players. That's the biggest problem, is that there are uh, communities of like-minded, you know, interested players who want to stop these guys, but they have to report all of this stuff up to Niantic. Niantic has the data. All right, and then player behavior, right? So one of the biggest issues with Pokemon Go has been that players are now showing up at, you know, uh, austere locations like the National Holocaust Museum and veterans 
memorials and other places, and graveyards and other places where you don't just go and set up a bunch of folding chairs and bust out the boom box and start having a party at two in the morning and capturing Pokemon. We, we as, as Ingress players need to bring them into the fold of what is the appropriate behavioral mores of using augmented reality and it is not making a goddamn nuisance of yourself and leaving trash and making it so that the ingress players as well as the, the Pokemon players are all demonized because we're nuisances. You have a comment? So I don't know, so, so in Ingress, the, so the question was, um, are, are you not limited to how many times you can spin a Pokestop in, in six hours? So in, in Pokemon, the way that you gather gear is you go to these locations, which are portals, and some of them are going to be called Pokestops, and when you go to them, there's like a circular thing, and you drag your finger across it, and it spins, and then little like stuff will fall out of it. Um, there is a delay, so you can do it once and then you have to wait five minutes. Just like when you hack a portal, you have to wait approximately five minutes for it to cool down and then you can hack it again. I don't know because I've actually not, I have not um, done enough work on Pokemon Go. I've only been playing it for a couple weeks. Does anyone know? Can you keep spinning it every five minutes forever? Right. Right. Yeah, so, so that is a good point. So, so in, in Ingress, you can hack four times, w short of putting special gear on the portals to allow you to do it more. Um, you can hack something four times. There's a five minute gap between each time. And then the portal becomes burned out. And you can't use it for about six hours. So it forces people to move on. Um, but yes, it, I, it is my understanding that you can't do this. This isn't the case in Pokemon Go. And yeah, that's, that's a problem. Like, there needs to be port you know, Pokestop burnout. Um, so people will just leave. Um, one of the suggestions that a colleague of mine made was that maybe Niantic should create a, a very low cost, but a paid um, private Ingress universe, which is parallel to the existing Ingress universe for free users, but where they have a payment method and a, and a way of contacting you that ties you to a real person's information. And if that account is found to be doing bad stuff with bots or spoofing or doing other goofy stuff, that that account can be banned and that account can be banned permanently across anybody, uh, anybody's game that Niantic is running in, in which they're using you know, the same payment information. So basically you ban the credit card that you're using to pay and then they can never log into any other Niantic game with an account that has tied to that credit card. I mean, that's one suggestion. But I'd like to hear more, and I, I don't know, do we have a mic that we can pass around to people? Um, come on up, and, and if you've got comments, I'm here to hear your suggestions, and I'll just type them in as you guys are talking about them. So one, one of the ones that was suggested was the uh, portal burnout on Pokestops. Are there any others? Yeah, speak out. So if you make a payment at uh, uh, somewhere in Vegas, but then you make a payment somewhere uh, somewhere in the UK, you can't like they have they have some mechanism for knowing that you can't physically make that that distance in time. So they could implement something like that in terms of their the user's interaction. So it would it would stop bots from teleporting. Well, it, it's, an, it's an interesting suggestion. So the one, the one thing that, um, that you should note is that the people who are using bots, create, they create completely separate accounts to play the game that are not tied to their, their real uh, Ingress player account. And they do that because they're afraid that at any time, Niantic could just kill that, could kill that account and they'd lose everything that's in that account. So they don't usually use those with any of the payment stuff. But yes, this does come down to, you know, is this person habitually playing in the US and is this credit card habitually used in the US? Like maybe they can do that, but I don't know whether they have that payment card information. I, I would suggest that the credit card companies would not share that. Yeah, they, they might not. They might not share it. Sorry, okay, go so, ahead. So so I don't necessarily mean the credit card information, but they have they have a mechanism of knowing that okay, there's a transaction here. Right. Okay, the card the card companies have this mechanism for knowing where the card gets used, but I don't know that they share that with the vendors who are who are using that. Sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. In the back. Okay. So look look at the look at behavior um, and determine what's being done to identify it. So for example, 
follow the money. If you've got a bot account, what is the bot generating? You're not going to have a bot account without it generating some value to you. And if it's generating a value, all of the stuff you want to give away, look at who it's giving it to. Right. So um, one of the things that happens in the game is that there are these uh, items called capsules, and capsules can hold 100 other items. And the capsules, when they're filled, get a unique, uh, is it 10 or 12 char hexadecimal character code that uniquely identifies that capsule. It should be rudimentary for Ingress, for, for Niantic, to be able to track player one created this value, put it in a capsule, dropped it on the ground. Player two came and picked up that capsule and benefited from it. Why are they not looking at that? That is, a, that is also one of the very good questions and one of the, one of the weak that points in the game is that they're not looking at this interaction. The way that those um, farm sites work where you buy the black market gear is they tell you, um, you know, you pay, you pay for the gear and then they say, let us know when you're going to be online and then you need to give us your very accurate GPS information. And then they do some test drops of gear. They'll drop a low value item on the ground. And if you see that appear on your scanner, then they drop a capsule full of the stuff that you paid for on the ground. They're doing that with bots. And the reason they need your location is because they need to type it into the bots little address bar, and then it sends it, it just teleports to that location, drops the gear, and then logs out. So again, you know, if you, if you are able to track when capsule A goes to player, from player one to player two, you know player one is the purveyor of this gear store, and you lock them out of the game. Or at least make it harder for them. Sorry, the person who's behind you had a question. Um, there may be a way to isolate assisted GPS from GPS data and correlate the two. So if, if say, your assisted GPS data say, says you're somewhere in Las Vegas and your GPS data being spoofed suddenly says you're in, you know, somewhere in East, Southeast Asia, um, that would be a, a, a direct red flag. Um, so if there was some way of requiring the phone to have a true assisted GPS, because if you're going to be connected to a cell tower, you're going to be getting that data anyway. Yes. So th this is actually an interesting point, and this is one of the metadata attributes that the analytics tools within Ingress are collecting. They're, they are collecting information about Wi-Fi access points that are in your area, and they're using Google's ability to search for uh, uh, location by uh, network to correlate, are you where the GPS says you are? Do you see the Wi-Fi APs that should be in this same location? And it's why Exposed works, because Exposed prevents the app from being able to see what are the nearby Wi-Fi access points. So, so they are doing that to a certain extent. Whether or not it's, it's effective is another thing. Sorry, uh, person in green, yes. Hi, um, I wanted to bring up the credit card verification. And in thinking about um, a couple of points, um, I've experienced using credit card verification uh, upping the ante so then you have to deal with fraudulent credit card numbers because you, by using a credit card, you're creating a situation where uh, those who really want to do bad things will do it with, by also stealing credit cards. Um, just a factor. And the other one being, uh, I was thinking about with credit card verification, granted there's already the barrier of entry to having a, a handheld device, but if we want more people to, to be able to play, to play the game, uh, a credit card requires a, a level of privilege or, or financial in how old you are and all of those things that also make it more complicated. So my challenge is, w and generally for the internet, how can we create a um, verification that isn't tied to credit cards, which are kind of US-based, not everywhere in the world, and like all the other things? I don't have any good answers, but I would love that to be a thing. Those are, those are really good suggestions and good questions. And yeah, I think you know, as I do more research on this, and I'm going to be presenting updates to this talk at other conferences, I'll look into that. And that's a very good suggestion. Thank you. So we'll be taking the last question. So. Yeah, so we're running out of time. There's drinking to be done. So last question, and then you guys can all go. But I, really, but I want to say, before I get this question, I want to thank you all for sticking it out right to the end. I really appreciate this. this is a, a, a topic that I'm very passionate about, and I just appreciate the, the attendance and the information and the, and the uh, interest level from everyone who's here, so thank you. All right, what's your question? All right, so um, I think that the GPS data is a perfect candidate for applying machine learning to train a model to differentiate between real GPS 
versus uh, these bots that seem to be pretty rudimentary. Uh, I don't think there's any advanced programming techniques or anything in them. You, you may be right. So machine learning is probably one of the tools that they're, they're trying to develop internally at Niantic. Uh, from my understanding, it's very limited because I tried to reach out to Niantic. To, I, I c tried to contact uh, John Hankey, their CEO, several times uh, in the weeks leading up to this. And, um, and they're just really busy with this other game that they're dealing with and all the issues. So they didn't have time to talk to me, but I'm hoping I get an opportunity to talk to them. They've been receptive in the past to suggestions from the community, and that's a good one. Is there any way to, for the app to get detected for friends? So uh, the question is, is there any way for the app to detect whether it's running the exposed framework? And no, the answer is no, because the exposed framework, uh, the way you install it, it installs as root, and you have to install it using like a third party, um, uh, 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 sorry? Yes, you have to have a third party bootloader, right? So, so you, fla you flash it at the lower level than the operating system, and nothing on the operating system can see it unless it lets it. So yeah, it's, it's tricky. So I guess we're out of time, so thank you so much. But uh, I'll be around here for questions afterwards. And then, by the way, there's a researcher party that Blue Coat is throwing. And if you're interested and you want to kind of come and have some drinks, just follow me, and I'm your ticket in. So thank you. <laughs> thank you, Andrew. <laughs> It's been done.